Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and the Douglas and Sarah Allison Auditorium. We're so delighted you've chosen to spend your evening with us. My name is Tom Spohr. I'm the director of the Center for National Defense here at the Heritage Foundation. We're really excited about tonight's event. As a uh, courtesy to the speaker, I would ask you to make a, a final check to make sure your mobile device is either silenced or turned off. And then uh, following the uh, General Chilton's remarks tonight, we'll have an opportunity for you to ask a question or two. And then there'll also be a, a reception out in the foyer here uh, immediately following the event. Well, every year, and other people will talk about this, the Heritage Foundation partners with the Marine Corps University Foundation to put on the annual K Colonel James D. McGinley Lecture. And each year, the James D. McGinley Lecture features a prominent speaker from the national security arena who provides his or her candid thoughts. And this year, we're pleased and honored to have General Retired Kevin Chilton, U.S. Air Force, and you'll hear more about his distinguished career in a moment. With the pending release of the Nuclear Posture Review and all the tensions and discussions about the nuclear issues surrounding the North Korea, this could not be more timely uh, or relevant for us. And so again, thank you for joining us tonight. My co-host tonight for this evening is Lieutenant General Richard Mills, United States Marine Corps retired. General Mills serves as the President and CEO of the Marine Corps University Foundation after retiring after a distinguished 40-year career in the United States Marine Corps in 2015. As an infantryman, he took part in operations in Bosnia, Somalia, Kosovo, Iraq, and Afghanistan. He commanded the 1st Marine Division and the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force and was the first Marine Corps General Officer to command NATO forces in combat. General Mills' final assignment was as Commander, Marine Forces Reserve, and Marine Forces Northern Command, New Orleans, Louisiana. Please join me in welcoming Lieutenant General Mills to the podium. Well, good afternoon. Good looking crowd. It tells me either the speaker's going to be very interesting or there's a very good reception afterwards. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps both. I hope both. I hope both. Uh, as, I am Lieutenant General Mills and I'm the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Marine Corps University Foundation at Quantico, Virginia. And on behalf of the Foundation and our Chairman General James Conway, it's my privilege to welcome uh, all of you to uh, this afternoon's lecture. Our motto at the Marine Corps University Foundation is educating 21st century leaders and warfighters. Our mission is to enhance uh, the professional military education and leadership development of active duty Marines, both at the campus at Quantico and at remote sites throughout our core. In addition to helping sponsor lectures such as the one we're going to hear tonight, uh, we endow 10 chairs to the university, we sponsor seminars or awards to the various students, uh, support staff rides, and provide overall operational support, support funds to the university. Uh, the foundation is extremely proud of its strong relationship with the Heritage Foundation. And the partnership between the two organizations has produced some wonderful events, as exemplified by tonight's uh, Colonel James D. McGinley lecture. Uh, the lecture series has sponsored numerous distinguished speakers over the years <laughs> who have addressed critical uh, current issues of national policy, national defense, and national security. One thing the talks have always generated is an interesting discussion and questions from the audience, and I certainly expect no less tonight from, from, uh, from you all. So be thinking. It's my pleasure now to introduce a Marine that really needs no introduction here at Heritage. Uh, and I got to tell you, anybody with a really cool call sign like Bullet, you got to know is an amazing individual. Colonel McGinley was commissioned in the Marines in 1981, and he quickly was designated as a naval aviator. During his very distinguished and decorated 32-year career, Colonel McGinley has served and commanded at all levels throughout the Marine Air Ground Task Force and served both in combat and in peace. As a naval aviator, he principally flew the legendary CH-53 heavy lift helicopter, but has also flown all of the rotary wing aircraft in the Marine inventory and some of the fixed wing aircraft. He has deployed on training evolutions throughout the world. Perhaps most importantly, he has taken a squadron as the commanding officer into combat. And again, performed extraordinarily well, and I know he's very proud of the, of the achievements of that squadron during that tough time. He has served in some real hot spots throughout the Corps. He served in the Pentagon. <laughs> That's a hot spot, let me tell you. 
that he's also served oh, oh, notably in uh, Ramadi, in El Ambar province uh, in Iraq, where a very nasty neighborhood when he was there, and one in which he helped to settle down, and we're still seeing benefits from his work on the streets of that, that city to this day. He's advised senior officers on the training of Iraqi security forces, but a man who goes to the sound of the guns, he's also walked the streets of Iraq with those same re security forces. He finished up as the as deputy commander of an expeditionary strike group in the, uh, in the Middle East, had over 20 warships, scores of aircraft, and nearly 5,000 Navy and Marine personnel under his command. And by the way, when he wasn't in uniform, he carved out an internationally renowned career as a seasoned litigator and as a supporter of the, of the judge, with elements of his career highlighted by Time Magazine and something Marines normally don't like to brag about, he appeared in a lead story on 60 Minutes in a very positive manner. His life has been amazing, uh, but tonight uh, we also have the pleasure of having his wife, Mary Beth, with us. And I tell you, Mary, uh, amazing must run in the family. Uh, she has quite a career as well, focused on the entertainment world, has received gold records. And in 2002, she was appointed by President George W. Bush and confirmed by the full Senate uh, to serve a six-year term as member of the National Council of the Arts. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor and my pleasure to introduce to you Colonel James Bullitt McGinley. General, thank you for that very kind introduction. I, I should tell you, for anybody who's been out in combat, if you look down and you think you're the first in, you recognize the footprints that were preceding you were from that man, General Mills. So in terms of I've been there and done that, you just saw the real deal. Well, tonight uh, it's my distinct pleasure to uh, introduce General Kevin Chilton, our guest speaker for tonight's lecture. Uh, General Chilton's career is, in a word, remarkable. The Cliff Notes version would say he's a former test pilot, an astronaut, combatant commander, retired four-star general. But the details are just too incredible not to share. General Chilton was a distinguished graduate from the US Air Force Academy in 1976 and earned his wings at Williams Air Force Base, Arizona in 1978. His first jet was the RF-4C, but he quickly transitioned to the F-15 Eagle. Thereafter, he was selected to attend, to attend U.S. Uh, Air Force Test Pilot School at Edwards Air Force Base in California. A quick study and a truly gifted pilot, General Chilton <coughs> finished first in his class for flight school, squadron officer school, and test pilot school. In 1987, General Chilton was selected for astronaut training and went on to fly the maiden voyage of Space Shuttle Endeavor in 1992, and two years again on uh, STS-59. His third and final trip to space was in 1996 as the commander of the Atlantis on STS-76. After 11 years with NASA, General Chilton returned to a variety of Air Force leadership assignments, including command of 8th Air Force, and the Joint Functional <coughs> Component Command for Space and Global Strike at Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana. General Chilton received his fourth star with his selection to lead Air Force Space Command in Colorado Springs. His final assignment in the Air Force was the commander of the United States Strategic Command off at Air Force Base in Nebraska. At the time, Strategic Command had responsibility for America's nuclear, space, cyber, global strike, and the integration of its missile defense capabilities. Focus on that because that's where we're heading. Since the reti his retirement, General Chilton has served on the boards of several companies, including Orbital ATK, Anadarko Petroleum Corporation, and Level 3 Communications. The general has more than 5,000 hours of flight time. Importantly, he's logged 704 hours in space and is the only former astronaut to achieve the grade of four-star general. Among many awards, General Chilton is the recipient of the Air Force Distinguished Service Medal, the Defense Superior Service Medal, the Legion of Merit, and the Distinguished Flying Cross. In 2012, our speaker was inducted 
into the United States Astronaut Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming General Kevin Chilton. Thank you, James Bullet. That was fantastic. Really, really a kind introduction. And uh, I want to begin by, well, let me set this down here. Well, there's a case of water down here. So <laughs> it's a good thing. JV, thanks for that because I'm fighting a cold. So I, I may go through about half of this anyway. So thank you. Um, I, I just couldn't be more pleased to join you all here tonight. I mean, I'm, I've, obviously, I've heard of, of the Heritage Foundation and have been an admirer of the work that the foundation does and the, the uh, things that they publish. Uh, and the research that they do to support those publications throughout my career uh, in the Air Force. And so um, it's really, it was flattering to be invited to come and speak tonight, frankly. And I want to thank a shout out to Admiral Bill Gortney, who was the one who uh, recommended me to you all to come, come here and, uh, and join you this evening. So I appreciate Bill's uh, confidence in me, and I hope I won't disappoint. I also want to thank the, the Marine Corps University Foundation. Please give my regards to the Commandant. Um, Jim and I served together when he was a uh, commandant of the Marine Corps, so please please give him my warm regards. General Mills, thank you for being here and for your support of this forum. And uh, Bullet, for you and Mary Beth uh, to have this uh, lecture series named after you shows clearly that you're big supporters. And thank you for that and for the opportunity to, to participate here. I also want to thank Tom Spear, who, who, uh, Spore here, who has really helped me in my uh, ability to be here tonight and be able to, to speak. And so, Tom, thanks very much for the, all that you've done there. And everybody else in the Heritage Foundation, that there's a bunch of you who I don't know. I know Rachel, I see her in the back row. Rachel, you know, has held my hand on figuring out all the logistics of being here. You know, when I was in on active duty, I, I truly, truly did my very best to love and appreciate my personal staff. I did not love and appreciate them enough, I found out in retirement. Uh, there's just no way. And when you're out there doing it all on your own, it, uh, you appreciate any extra help you get. So thank you, Rachel, for, for helping me get here and to the rest of the staff. You know, I, when, I, when uh, Tom first contacted me, we started talking about this evening's events and, and this particular forum. Um, I, I was asking questions about, you know, the tone and, you know, what, what, what kind of some, are, some of the other subjects that have been covered in the past. And he says, oh, well, here's a YouTube link to uh, Jim Mattis's presentation from last year. So I said, okay. Well, Jim and I uh, were actually confirmed together. We both testified in front of the Senate the same day. That's when we met, uh, preparations for that, when he was confirmed to be the JFCOM commander and, and I the STRATCOM commander. and, and uh, and, and so we've been friends since then, and I'm a great admirer of the secretary. I put on this uh, YouTube video and watched the whole thing twice because the guy is so brilliant. I mean, everything he said and talked about was just so special and meaningful. Um, and then after I finished, I thought, oh, my gosh, how am I going to fill those shoes? So it's a, it's a tough act to follow when uh, the year after you're following the now Secretary of Defense, uh, General Jim Mattis, and he did a spectacular job. If I could set the tone for tonight, you know, when I was growing up in the Air Force, at least on my background, uh, there was people referred to as members of the nuclear priesthood, which, you know, you'd envision these guys with the little monk habits on and walking around banging the drums, saying, you know, bring out your dead or whatever, you know, from the old, old movies. Uh, but there was a group of professionals in the Air Force who spent their whole career in Strategic Air Command. They came in, they served either in the ICBM fields or they served in bomber alert or tanker alert facilities, maintenance, munitions loaders, pilots, navigators, gunners. Um, they'd spent their whole career. And, and there was no doubt in their mind uh, what their mission was and why they were doing their mission and the importance of their mission. It was just inbred in their culture in Strategic Air Command. That was the nuclear priesthood. I was a knucklehead fighter pilot. Okay, doing the conventional mission, having fun, flying fun airplanes. And, and frankly, I didn't spend two seconds thinking about the nuclear deterrent, except one class as a cadet at the Air Force Academy. And believe it or not, in the early 1970s, middle of the Cold War, uh, I remember doing a war game in a military <coughs> studies class where we actually did a simulated you know, back and forth nuclear exchange scenario with the Soviets. But for that, uh, 
the word nuclear never entered my mind or came out of my mouth until 1998 when I returned from NASA to Air Force Base Command for my first assignment as a deputy director of operations. And uh, I found out in those days, uh, Air Force Base Command organized, trained, and equipped the ICBM force. And, and fortunately, my executive officer in that job was an ICBM crew member, former. And so he took me under his wing, uh, young Major Epperson, and educated Colonel Chilton on the nuclear deterrent, 1998. So what does this tell you about me? I'm like a reformed smoker, OK? And there's nothing worse than hanging out with a reformed smoker if you smoke. Even if you don't smoke, they're kind of a pain, because they're always telling you all the things you can be doing better to improve your health, because they've done it. I'm that way about the nuclear deterrent, OK? I came to it late in life. Uh, because of the jobs I had, I became a student of it. I took the mission, the job seriously, and I tried to become as educated as possible on the issues surrounding nuclear deterrence uh, ever since 1998. So you got to understand I'm a little bit of a convert here. Now, most Americans, and even some in the US military, uh, unfortunately, will never have the opportunity, like me, to be educated on the nuclear deterrent. And we'll not find time to ponder why we even have it or understand the utility of it today and in the future, which there certainly is. You know, and since the end of the Cold War, along with the dramatic reduction in the number of weapons in our nuclear stockpile and the deterioration of the infrastructure required to support that stockpile and the aging of the delivery systems in the triad, and the, there's been a dearth of attention paid to the rationale for the nuclear deterrent. In reality, the underlying principles and rationale for the deterrent really have not gone away. But from through the 1990s and the early parts of this century, we stopped educating, we stopped thinking, we stopped having informed debates on the necessity and the role of the US nuclear deterrent in today's world and tomorrow. In my Air Force, we essentially raised three generations of Air Force officers who were not exposed to the most fundamental and yet relevant arguments surrounding deterrence from the late nuclear theorists Herman Kahn and Thomas Schelling. By the way, since we're talking about a great university that's interested in education, if you are a serious student, in my opinion, of deterrence, uh, on your bookshelf should be a, a tome by Keith Payne. Uh, Dr. Keith Payne, Missouri State University. So uh, it's entitled The Great American Gamble. It came out in 2008, and I'm not getting any uh, extra money from Keith for this, but you can find it on Amazon. But it's a, it's a book that when it came out in 2008, right after I became commander of STRATCOM, I read cover to cover, tabbed, underlined, and it still sits on my bookshelf today. And what Keith does is he kind of captures the thoughts and rationale behind Thomas Schelling and Herman Kahn, and the two great schools of thought that were invented in the 1960s and 70s that are still as applicable today as they were then when you start thinking about nuclear deterrence. So we stopped thinking about it for about 15 years uh, in our military and in the Air Force. And you know, when you stop thinking about something, in my experience, typically what, stops, what follows this is stop investing in it. And when you stop investing in it, you start to lose focus. And yet, if you're still telling people to do what you're not investing in and you're not focused on, uh, what happens to them? Morale goes down. And when morale goes down and focus goes down, you know what happens. Bad things. And we saw that in 2007. It's a tremendous wake-up call for the United States Air Force when in 2007, six nuclear-armed air launch cruise missiles were inadvertently and unintentionally loaded on a B-52 at uh, Minot Air Force Base, North Dakota, and flown to Barksdale Air Force Base. Actually, they weren't not ALCMs, they were air launch crew, they were ACMs. Mistakenly loaded, inadvertently loaded, and flown down there unintentionally. Now, a former uh, SAC commander, a uh, mentor of mine, uh, said, you know, it's probably the best thing that could have happened to the Air Force. First of all, if you look at it, um, nobody was hurt. Nobody died. We never lost control of the weapons. They were guarded at Minot. They flew down there in the hands of a, a trained crew. 
they landed there guarded at Barksdale. Um, and so, you know, there was nothing, uh, no serious consequence uh, as a result of this movement other than the absolute uh, horrifying embarrassment of having done it. Unimaginable that this could have happened during the heyday of Strategic Air Command when the Air Force was clearly focused on its number one priority to national defense, the maintenance of two legs of the strategic triad. But here we are in 2007, and in fact, it does happen, this wake-up call. Now, before you know, I throw you know, rocks in a glass house, context matters here. You know, in, the, in the 1990s, with the collapse of the Soviet Union and confidence ex expectations of a new relationship with Russia, that, that really dominated our thought. And so it, it makes sense that in some respect, if you're an optimist, that things will never go backwards, they'll only go forward, things will only get better, that maybe we don't need to spend as much money or pay as much attention on the nuclear deterrent. So I, I'm not casting stones here. Um, it's just a fact that that's what happened. And then you turn into this century, and what happens in the first year of this century? We have 9-11. And where does our, sh our focus shift in this country to terrorism, global terrorism? Uh, the injury done and the death caused on our American soil by terrorists certainly gripped the country and it gripped the Department of Defense and all the services. So it's a little bit understandable how our focus could have been taken off the nuclear deterrent during these time periods. I remember in uh, 2008 there was a, a document produced, it was draft at the time, called the, the Joint Operating Environment, the Joe. I think it may still be produced today, I'm pretty sure it is. And the Joe was produced by uh, the, the Joint Staff uh, or, or JFCOM at the time. And what the Joe is meant to do is lay, uh, it's an analysis, an intelligence analysis and a political military analysis to lay the foundation for a national military strategy, which of course flows down from the national security strategy. And you know, it's, it's supposed to say what the geopolitical environment's gonna be like, what the threats are gonna be like for the coming years as you plan your strategy, you know, your strategy's five, 10 years, 10 years long, whatever. And what would be in rank order the, the number one threat, the number two threat to the United States of America. So we had a gathering of all the combatant commanders and the, uh, the Joint Chiefs and to look at a high level you know, summary of the Joe before it went for signature. Number one on the list in 2008, the number one threat to the United States of America was if a terrorist organization were to get a hold of one or two uh, small nuclear devices and detonate them in the United States of America. Now, there is no doubt in my military mind that would be an awful day for the United States of America, certainly for the citizens of the city in which they detonated it in. But nowhere in that list was Russia or China as the number one threat, nowhere. Some guy raised his hand in the room and said, um, I don't think I agree with the number one threat. It's a bad one, and we gotta do something about that for sure. But if that happened, the United States of America would survive. It'd be a god awful day for the folks in that city and downwind of that city and for the country in the short term. But the, Const the Constitution would endure, and the civilization of America would endure, and we would press on. There would be changes. TSA would get a little tougher, I think, for sure. But we would endure. On the other hand, there are two nations on the planet in 2008 who could absolutely destroy the United States of America. And by that I mean you tear up the Constitution. You go back to the bottom wrong of Maslow's pyramid for the population of the United States. You're focused only on getting food, water, and shelter, those of you that survive and live. Because there is no government, there's no organizational support, there are no utilities, there's nothing left to support a civilized society in America. It's the total destruction of the country. That's an existential threat. That still existed in 2008, every much or worse so since China, the rise of China, more so than uh, it did in 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed. Its so weapons had not gone away and they weren't pointed somewhere else. The existential threat to the United States of America, in my view then and now, remains the number one and should always be the number one threat on the joint operating environment. 
the 2016 Joe kind of validated that, which was nice to see. Uh, it mentions the importance of the nuclear deterrent several times and the possibility that nuclear weapons could proliferate and maybe even be used in the coming years up to 2035 got my attention. I guess 2036 we can relax. But no, I think that's all, that's all the further they were asked to analyze out to. So they, they covered the waterfront up to as far as they were asked to go. Uh, before I go forward here, I think let's, let's level the playing field on lexicon. I think lexicon is really important. And so uh, what is, I'm going to define deterrence. And, and just to be, um, you know, to go to a, a good source, I went to the dictionary, and, which is always a good place to start, right? And so the, the dictionary says uh, the definition of deterrence. Uh, to deter is defined as to turn aside, to discourage, or prevent someone from acting. Pretty straightforward. Now, uh, the key is the notion, the key notion is uh, that someone or some decision body can be influenced by the actions of another. That's the key to deterrence. You have to uh, accept that. In the context of nuclear deterrence, the intent is to cause a decision maker or decision makers, in the case of the Chinese likely, the CMC, to refrain from certain acts under certain circumstances out of fear that if they take those actions, they will either, one, fail to achieve their objectives, and that's called deterrence by denial, or two, they will suffer such unacceptable consequences that they decide not to do it, and that is deterrence by threat of punishment. Now, there's one other piece of this in the nuclear deterrence area that's really important to consider, and when we talk about North Korea later, this will come back. When you're trying to deter someone from acting in this regard, as they weigh, well, the success of achieving what they want to do and the pain that they might be inflicted on them, they must also come to the conclusion that if they do nothing, that that will be a more tolerable circumstance. In other words, that inaction, in light of the threatened consequence, must be the least worst option. Hold that thought. We'll come back to that when we talk about Korea. So, so why do we have these things anyway? Well, the, the 2010 Nuclear Posture Review and just about every other statement you can find on nuclear deterrence in America says, we have nuclear weapons to deter attack on the United States and our allies. And further, with regard to our allies, the U.S. nuclear deterrent is meant to assure them that the United States will use its nuclear arsenal to, de to deter adversary aggression against them as well. We offer this uh, nuclear umbrella really for two reasons. One, it builds really tight relationships with our allies, and that's important. And America has great allies and friends. I mean, you, start, you could fill a sheet of paper with our friends and allies around the world. Uh, with Russia, you could maybe one line. Uh, China, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe, maybe one line. Uh, so it, it's a great strength that we have. And, and for particularly close allies, we extend the nuclear umbrella protection for them. But there's a second reason we extend this umbrella to them. Um, we don't want them to build their own nuclear arsenal. Even though they're friends and allies, uh, our policy has been that if everybody had them, it's not a particularly safer world. And so our assurance policy in our, in our nuclear deterrence policy is really part of a U.S. nonproliferation policy, and it's really important. Now, if you're going to deter somebody, you've got to have two things. First, you've got to have a capability that they fear, right? And the second thing is you've got to have will to use it. It doesn't do you any good if you have the capability. If the adversary thinks, they'll never use it. They don't have the will. They don't have the spine. They don't have the nerve. Capability becomes immaterial then. So it really takes both. And it's important that it's clear in the adversary's mind that you have both these things, capability and will. So it's important that you demonstrate them. Now, in the uh, closing days of World War II, the United States certainly demonstrated its capability and will over the skies of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And that, uh, the detonation of those two weapons close out and end that war, I assure you, it was not forgotten by the world. It was a change, it was a moment in history that changed the way we looked at warfare probably forever. It certainly has changed it, it's the way we look at it up to this point. 
So there was a clear demonstration of capability and will. In the Cold War, we and the Soviets demonstrated our capability and will by exercising our legs at the triad, sorting our submarines, testing our missiles, testing our ICBMs, putting our bombers on alert, flying our bombers, sending them to decision points and caps with nuclear weapons on board, and by conducting over 1,054 in the United States nuclear explosive tests, 219 of which were done above ground, filmed, or in shallow waters, that clearly showed the power and effect as these weapons became ever more and more powerful against fleets of ships, against military vehicles, against structures. To make sure the world and our adversary, the Soviets, understood clearly what our capabilities were, and in testing and, and exercising these things, we certainly were hoping to demonstrate to them our will so that they would be deterred. Today, we no longer test but we, the weapon systems, or I should say the warheads, but we do test the ICBMs, we do test the SLBMs, and we do fly our bombers. Um, the bomber leg, um, the Russians do the same, of course. They, they fly their ICBMs and their SLBMs across Siberia and land them in Kamchatka. Our target of choice in the Air Force is the Kwajalein Atoll. Uh, but it's all a, 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 a method of showing each other that, yes, we still have this deterrent. It's credible. It's capable. And we're willing to use it if, we, if you put us in a position where we have to. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the bomber leg, though. Um, the, the Russians have continued to exercise the bomber leg since, I would say, over the last 15 years. Uh, not so much during the 90s, because they were just flat broke and, and broken their military, not their nuclear <coughs> capability. Oh, by the way, the one thing they did not let atrophy, they get it. But of late, uh, last 10 years, you'll see bear bombers, which are cruise missile capable, flying off the coast of Alaska, off the coast of Canada, even up and down the coast of my home state of California and the eastern seaboard of the United States to demonstrate that they still have that capability and they can reach out and touch us with cruise missiles that can range the entire continent of the United States from their launch points. We, on the other hand, took the bombers off alert in 1992 and when we did, again, due to other priorities, we stopped kind of paying attention to the nuclear mission. And I would argue that um, for the nuclear mission, the bomber leg of the triad atrophied in the 1990s. Um, because they'd been taken off constant alert and because of the breakups of Strategic Air Command as part of that as well, and the lack of focus in the time period on that mission, it really put that leg of the triad, in my view, in question as far as credibility went. Um, in 2008, if you look at, uh, in the late, in the early part of the 2000s and all the way up to 2008, if you look at uh, how U.S. Strategic Command was exercising the bomber leg, um, they were just doing what we called CPX exercises, so command post exercises. Uh, no forces were generated, no people did anything different in their daily job except the people in the command posts who are passing messages back and forth. Now, there's great value to this because the critical part of the nuclear deterrent is the command and control element. I mean, you have to be able to push information up to the decision makers that advise the president, and we have to be able to make sure the decisions taken by the president are executed or pushed out to the forces at a minimum. But none of that, that's all we were doing. In 2008, Strategic Command shifted from just doing CPX to an FTX, which is a force training exercise. For the first time in a long, long time, we put air crews on alert, we put bombers on alert, we put tankers on alert, we put ISR aircraft on alert, we put the crews on alert, uh, maintenance on alert, security forces on alert, we uploaded nuclear weapons on our bombers, downloaded the nuclear weapons, sent launch orders and scrambled the bombers who hit their tankers, who practiced flying the same distance they would have to fly to fly their nuclear mission, and then recovered them to dispersal bases in the United States, just like we would do it in the war plan for the first time in a long, long time. And the command has continued to do that since then. And I think it's been a, a, a good thing for morale, for sure. People are getting to do what their mission is. It's a good thing for signaling our capability and probably most importantly, it's intentionally made visible to China and Russia to create awareness of our will and capability. 
Now, we, we can signal strength and, and will through these kinds of exercises. There's another way to do it, too, and that's through declaratory policy or rhetoric. Um, when Nikita Khrushchev pounded his shoe on the podium in the United Nations and told the United States of America, quote, we will bury you, he wasn't talking about coming over here with a shovel and throwing dirt on the country. He was talking about the nuclear capability he had in his inventory. It was a, a sign of will that he was you know, expressing to the world. John Kennedy made a rhetorical statement. Actually, it was more than that. It was a red line. It's a policy statement in the middle of the Cuban Missile Corp crisis that, if you think about it, was incredibly bold and a gamble. He said, a launch of a nuclear missile from Cuba against any target in the Western Hemisphere, any target in the Western Hemisphere, not just the United States, would be met with a full retaliatory response of the United States against the Soviet Union. That's a pretty strong red line. I think it gave Khrushchev some pause, certainly, at what he was putting at risk there. So rhetoric, training, exercise, all of these things can be important for not only showing capability, but demonstrating will. So could the unthinkable happen? You know, between the United States and Russia, the, the credibility of each of our respective deterrent forces, I think uh, the credibility is well understood and the capability. You know, both of us face an existential threat today. Russia from us and us from Russia. We have similar stakes than on the poker table of, of deterrence, existence of our nations. The strategic nu nuclear relationship is considered to be stable from a strategic nuclear capability. And what that means, and I want to define this as well as part of my lexicon tonight, because you hear the word uh, when people talk about maybe developing a new weapon or an article about the air launch cruise missile, follow on that these things are destabilizing. I think this word gets thrown around a lot in a lot of different contexts. And I don't, here's the context I want it to be understood in for my talk tonight. Strategic to st stability means that the other side is never tempted to go first. That's a stable relationship. How, how might they be tempted to go first? If you show a weakness that they think they can take advantage of. Now, that would be a pretty good weakness. But if you are substantially weaker in some area and they think they can take it and you give them that position to live in where there's a chance that they might calculate one day they could take advantage of that, that's an unstable relationship. So let me give you an example of an unstable relationship. Let's say the triad had not been supported and we decided to go to a dyad and, um, excuse me, and we eliminated the uh, ICBM leg of the, of the triad. That was, you know, a popular discussion a year or two ago. Let's just do away with the 400 silos we have with uh, missiles in them scattered across the northern tier of the United States. That would be an example of an incredibly destabilizing move. Why? Today, Russia and the United States have agreed to 1,550 warheads as a limit to our strategic deterrence. Okay? It's calculated, based on their yield and accuracy of their weapons, it would take at least two Russian ICBMs or SLBMs per silo to guarantee that they would destroy a, a single ICBM in the ground. So, to go first, if you want to survive the war, the Russians would have to target at least 800 of their 1,550 warheads at those ICBM silos. They take them away, what do they have to hold at risk? Five targets. Bangor, Washington, subport. Kings Bay, Georgia, subport. B-2 bomber base at Whiteman. B-52 bomber base at Minot. B-52 bomber base at Barksdale. Sat in Washington and our nuclear weapons storage site. Seven nukes. The U.S. has no, no, no remaining nuclear weapons in its inventory. The only nuclear weapons it has are those on the few boats that are deployed at sea. 
And what if one day the head of the Russian Navy wakes up and says, Mr. President, we're behind one of the submarines. We can sink it on your orders. Now, there's that many less U.S. remaining. So the Russians could expend about five to seven nuclear weapons, still have 1,540 some odd remaining, and the U.S. would have whatever happened to be at sea that day. And then Russia could look at us and say, so, what's your next move, U.S.? You really want to shoot those 200 or so remaining warheads when we got 1,400 <coughs> remaining? Or do you want to bend to our will? Getting rid of the ICBM is terribly destabilizing and not a good idea. And that's what I mean by stability. It invites the possibility of consideration of a first strike with the ICBM field. They not only know they have to put that many warheads on it, when those warheads arrive, the missiles might be gone because they're on alert and postured to launch within the time of flight of the Russian missiles. So there's no way you would ever wake up in Russia and say today would be a good day to attack the United States of America with our nuclear weapons. That, you know, knowing full well you would be destroyed. Now, there's a, um, a, new, a little change that's going on uh, right now that I want to shift my discussions from on the strategic level to a little more of the, the, the theater level. Um, the Russians, uh, as I mentioned, with regard to our relationship between them is in a strategic sense, there's a sense of strategic stability. However, there's been a, a recent change in the Russian declaratory policy under Vladimir Putin that, that gives me some pause. Um, and it may reflect, and I think it does reflect, the consideration of a lower threshold for first use. I don't mean against the continental United States, but I mean against fielded U.S. forces. Russia's new declaratory policy is to threaten to escalate to limited nuclear use to coerce Western capitulation in a conventional conflict they see as not going in their favor, and to actually uh, launch limited nuclear strikes for this reason, if necessary. They talk about escalating to nuclear first strike to de-escalate a conventional conflict. It's not a new thought. We actually thought about this in the Cold War in the 70s when we were vastly outnumbered in the fold of gap by the Soviet and Warsaw Pact conventional forces. We hung nuclear weapons on every fighter jet in Europe. We had nuclear artillery rounds. We had Honest John recoilless rockets. We had Pershing II missiles eventually. Uh, we used our nuclear deterrent to deter that conventional overmatch. The Russians are talking about something a little bit diff diff different here. They're talking about coercion and escalation in a conventional fight that we didn't start, likely, but is not going in their favor. You know, as soon as one starts talking about first use in localized theater conventional conflicts, and by the way, not just the Russians, but the Chinese have talked about this, it demands that we not only start thinking about and wargaming these type scenarios, but also that we closely examine our current nuclear structure, force structure, and posture, and ask ourselves if we have the right equipment to first, and always, to first deter this type of behavior, maybe even convince them to reverse their policy. And second, to present appropriate response options to the President of the United States should they actually carry through on their threat. Now let me shift to uh, North Korea. You know, and so as we've talked about, Russia and China and the United States have similar stakes in the nuclear game. North Korea is different. So it's, it's, it's a different problem than anything we've faced in the last 70 years. In the last 70 years, it's been about mutual stakes, mutual similar capabilities, mutual threats, mutual fears. <coughs> North Korea, they're all in on this poker table, okay? We hold an absolute existential threat over North Korea. North Korea does not hold an absolute existential threat over the United States of America. It's different stakes. And what does that mean? How can we think about this? How can we deter them? You know, this imbalance in stakes is uh, a new twist and it is important to analyze the impact of the imbalance because it's possible that the threshold for first use is different when an imbalance exists. 
you know, during the Cold War, we targeted a lot of things in the Soviet Union, mostly because we weren't exactly sure which each succeeding premier feared. Remember, it's important to understand what your adversary fears. The Chinese only had, early on under Mao, they only had 20 intercontinental ballistic missiles with not very accurate four megaton warheads on top of them, huge. Why only 20? Well, he wasn't going to shoot at our military. He was going to shoot at our cities. He knew what we feared. He knew what we valued. And I'm proud of that, by the way. I'm proud that in the United States of America, you know, over, the, over Russia, North Korea, and China, we value our citizens. We value human life more than they do. I believe that. At least they're leaders. Okay. And they know that. They know we fear that. Mao did. So he didn't see any big need at, uh, during his era to feel much more than, than those. And, and so the United States, we weren't quite sure what the Russians feared. You know, and so we, we didn't deliberately target population centers, uh, but there were targets close to population centers in the Cold War, and there certainly would have caused a lot of civilian casualties, and uh, it, it would have been uh, horrible should that uh, deterrent have to be unleashed. The strategy was not like Mao's, which was kind of a minimal deterrence, counter value, counter people strategy at all. Um, we didn't just have the minimum capability to threaten and destroy all of their cities. It's quite frankly, we didn't know if Stalin gave a damn about his cities. I mean, remember, after World War II, after the end of World War II, Stalin is responsible for the death of 25 million Soviets, his own people either starved, shot, killed, sent to the gulag of his own people. It's unimaginable to us. So you kind of wonder, well, maybe threatening his people isn't exactly what he fears. He's famously quoting for, quoted as saying, the death of a single human being is a tragedy. The death of 25 million is a statistic. That's Joe Stalin. Mao Zedong is quoted as saying, I don't need a lot of nuclear weapons to deter the United States. If I kill 300 million of them and they kill 300 million of us, I still have a billion people and they have nothing. So counter value, minimum deterrence, can you be sure that's going to work against men like this? Against men like Kim Jong-un? Against men like Adolf Hitler, Tojo, Osama bin Laden? Do you think the last of them has been born and will rise to power? Has humanity changed so much? I see no evidence of it. So we have to be careful. Now, North Korea, the imbalance of stakes, ironically, could lead Kim Jong-un, obviously a tyrant who doesn't give much concern to his own people, to nuclear first use. You know, when he recalls the fate of Saddam Hussein, of Muammar Gaddafi, and the likely end game for himself should a conventional fight break out on the Korean Peninsula for whatever reason, either instigated by himself or for whatever reason. Um, he might conclude that he has nothing more to lose by crossing the nuclear threshold in a conventional fight. Presented in nuclear deterrence term, in spite of the U.S. existential threat, Kim could decide using a nuclear weapon may not be his personal least worst option. So that's an important thing to consider when there's an imbalance of stakes. Let me move to uh, our assurance of allies. I want to dwell on that for a little bit because we had a, a time period where our assurance over the years has been put into question and not too long ago. Um, when it's very, I think the important thing to understand when you consider our policy of assurance and extending the nuclear umbrella, we do not get to decide, the United States of America, if our allies are assured. They do. Does that make sense? You know, I can't, I can't say, you feel comfortable. No, you have to tell me you feel comfortable, okay? I'm not allowed to dictate that to you. And I, in 2010, we learned this lesson. So the, so the situation was, you know, after all this period, you know, the emphasis on, on the nuclear deterrent mission, the United States Navy had a cruise missile called the TLAM-N. Now, the TLAM you've heard of, the, Tomahawk land attack missile, the conventional version. It's flown in just about every conflict since Desert Storm. Very accurate cruise missile launched from submarines or launched from surface ships, good range. Does its job, the conventional warhead. In the Cold War, we had a nuclear variant of that 
and it was armed, uh, loaded on its fast attack submarines in certain areas of the world, certain submarines. And the Japanese knew about it, and we talked about this as part of the extended U.S. deterrent for them. But, you know, uh, other priorities and budgets and all totally understandable led to uh, the, the Navy deciding to bring these missiles off the ships, bring them ashore, put them into storage. And when the Obama admission, the administration came in with a, a new policy to uh, de-emphasize or reduce the role, was the words used, of the nuclear deterrent, there seemed like a great opportunity here to send a signal to the world that uh, we're reducing the role of nuclear deterrents and here's an actual concrete thing we're doing we, uh, we're, we'll tell the world we no longer have these things on our submarines and we're going to get rid of them. We're going to retire them and, get, and dismantle the warheads. It made perfect sense in a budget constrained environment for the, the way the world was at the time. So we sent a delegation over before this was rolled out to visit with the Japanese and they were not happy to our surprise um, because they looked at the world through a different lens and they looked at their region through a, a different lens. Um, they objected because they believed the TLAM-N with its forward presence, so it was, a, it was a theater weapon, not a strategic weapon in their mind, in the Western Pacific was the only credible deterrent to the Chinese and the Russians. They questioned the credibility of a U.S. deterrent based only on the U.S. threat of launching an intercontinental ballistic missile or a submarine launch ballistic missile from either our ICM, ICBM fields in the northern tier or from the Ohio-class submarines. They did not think the Chinese or the Russians would adequately believe such threats. What had assured them was a nuclear capability that had a smaller yield than an ICBM, which could be deployed from in-theater for an in-theater scenario, and that would have the possibility of not presenting a threat to major cities of the combatants involved, but instead could be used in a tactically credible manner. The Japanese believed the threat of the United States using TLAM ends <coughs> provided a credible deterrent to attack on them. Furthermore, and most importantly, they believed the Chinese and Russians felt the same way and would be undeterred by a threat of ICBM or SLBM launch because of the consequences that could result back on the United States, the trading of Seattle for Tokyo. The Japanese were not happy. Through much dialogue, I think we, we I know, we eventually got them comfortable but it took um, convincing them that the bomber leg of the triad, which in 2010 was just beginning to do FTXs again and show its capability, could indeed be a, an effective deterrent as part of the umbrella. And in fact, if you look at our continuous bomber deployment to Guam since 9-11 you know, <coughs> and that time period as we started using forces in Korea to support the war in the Middle East, it sent a strong signal of support to the Japanese and to our South Korean allies. And so when you see a B-2 flying over the South Korean peninsula in an exercise, or a B-52 flying over the peninsula in an exercise, it's doing it as much to deter North Korean aggression as to assure the South Koreans and the Japanese that the umbrella is there and will be there to deter and protect them as well. So again, the bottom line, the footstopper in the case of assurance, we can't decide assurance. Uh, for somebody else. Um, and in some cases, I think a history will show our assurance failed. The French have a nuclear deterrent because Charles de Gaulle was not going to count on the U.S. nuclear umbrella. In his mind, we wouldn't trade New York for Paris, so he had to develop his own deterrent. Israel could not be assured by anyone in the West and reportedly has its own unacknowledged nuclear deterrent. Now there's good news here, folks, so it's not all gloom and doom, you know. I mean, I say, when you start talking about nuclear deterrence, look, when I get up, uh, I, every, every time I give a talk on nuclear deterrence, the number of Christmas cards I get every year goes down, you know. And it might be the one that I send out with me standing next to a B-61 with, you know, lipstick on it. That, no, I didn't do that. But, you know, I, you, you, anytime you start talking about this, people are just appalled. How, how can you be in favor of nuclear deterrence? Well, I am. So, there, but there is good news here. So let's let's switch that beat. The good news is, civilian and military leadership in this com in this country today, recognize the importance and the relevance of the nuclear deterrent. They've said so in testimony, from the chairman of the Joint Chiefs to every head of, of the service chiefs to the vice chairman to our political leadership in the Department of Defense. Uh, every president, if you stop and look at it. And it since the invention of the triad, all the way through the Obama administration, its closing days, supported the triad. It's 
been debated. That's fair. It's always fair to have a debate. Uh, usually those, those debates don't come up the way they do if everybody's a little more educated on the subject. But remember, for 15 years, we took a holiday on thinking on it. So, I mean, I'm, I'm optimistic that going forward that the public debate, the information out there to have a good, well-informed debate is out there and that reasonable people are making good decisions on the deterrent today. The other piece of good news is, you know, the triad is supported and it's evidence it's re supported. The recapitalization of every leg of the triad is being supported and that's evidenced by the budget submissions by the White House and what the Congress is appropriating. So th this is really good news in my, in my view. However, there, there are some important questions about the deterrent remain on, that remain on the table. You know, unlike Russia, China, Pakistan, India, and North Korea, the United States has uniquely and unilaterally decided not to build new nuclear weapons. Every one of those other countries is today in production designing and building new nuclear capability. We're maintaining our current stockpile of weapons. And what is in that stockpile? Well, we have the B-61 gravity bomb for the B-2 bomber. We have the W-80 warhead for the cruise missile for the B-52 bomber. We have the W-78 and the W-87 for the ICBM force. And we have the W-76 and the W-88 for the submarine launched ballistic missile force. Those are the variants that we have. Now what's interesting is the numbers associated with these warheads is the year that they were designed and produced. So let me start at the beginning, B-61. It's our principal tactical nuclear weapon in the NATO forces in Europe and the weapon that the B-2 carries. W-88, that's our newest one, designed and built in 1988. Other countries today, their serial numbers begin with numbers like 2017, 2016, and they continue to build. This is a unilateral decision. Life extension is the only allowed effort to sustain our deterrent. While every other most every other nuclear-armed country is building, new weapons, and, in the case of the Russians for sure, and the Chinese, adding to their numbers in their inventory. Russia is not only building new strategic nuclear weapons for their ICBMs and SLBMs, within the START treaty limits, and we have to give them credit for that, but they're also building tactical and theater nuclear weapons. They're building weapons to go on surface terror missiles, to go on to surface to surface missiles. They're building weapons, nuclear depth charges, nuclear torpedoes, nuclear cruise missiles to go on ships and submarines. They've not stopped creating new and different ways to use the nuclear weapons to both deter, coerce, and support their declaratory policy. They've even talked about arming icebreakers in the Arctic with cruise missiles that can range the continental United States. That's not constrained by the START treaties. They've even supposedly accidentally revealed the existence of a long-range nuclear-powered underwater vehicle that can trans-Pacific range and speed that allows it not to be either, if you can detect it, to be sunk and stopped, armed with a multi-megaton warhead designed to create maximum fallout to impact in Seattle, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and San Diego and create a nuclear cloud that would disperse across the United States of America, carried on the prevailing westerly winds, and destroy our ability of our breadbasket to produce food. This weapon is not constrained by START treaties either. We constrain ourselves. Everyone else is behaving in an unconstrained fashion. And the notion that our leadership, by constraining ourselves, is having an effect, is not supported at all, that I can tell, by any empirical data. So, despite the Russian pledge to decrease their tactical nuclear weapons inventory, they've increased it. And we've eliminated ours, essentially, and the Russians are building up. And China, who once under Mao felt it was adequately 
uh, armed in its deterrence posture with 20 ICBMs, is now building land mobile ICBMs that are MIRVed. They're building a submarine that can launch ICBMs as well, as well as many short range and inter intermediate range ballistic missiles that have both convention, conventional and nuclear capability that hold at risk our regional allies, who we assure, provide the umbrella for, as well as US forces fielded in the Western Pacific in the theater, both afloat and, and ashore. Now, the development of new weapon systems and new warheads uh, that put at risk our forces in Asia and Europe, as well as the US homeland, is the path the Russians and Chinese are on. Um, meanwhile, uh, we prohibit design, even, of new weapons by, by the Congress. But even more worrisome to me is even if tomorrow the Congress should change its position and the administration should support it, and they were to turn to the Department of Energy and said, you know, enough's enough. We either need more tactical nuclear weapons or some geopolitical thing has happened. We need new strategic capability that we want to replace one for one within START. Or um, we've had a failure in one of those old warheads I talked about, and we need to actually put them back in, remanufacture them to, to feel them, to keep our deterrent credible. Even if they were given the green light to design and build a single new type of nuclear warhead, our ability to do so is at best problematic. The infrastructure that once existed in the Cold War to design, engineer, and manufacture nuclear warheads in mass, in the words of the Bipartisan Commission, the Perry Schlesinger Commission in 2009, that infrastructure uh, is decrepit. And it remains so today. Now, there's been improvements, and there have been investments. But go to Oak Ridge if you ever get a chance and take a look at how we're operating out there. It's shameful. Absolutely shameful the facilities we provide for the people who are responsible for maintaining these weapons, even in our life extension programs. Even more concerning to me, and I think to most of the leadership at the national labs, I won't speak for them, but I suspect they would echo this, is the aging out of the human capital that knows how to build a nuclear weapon, who knows the physics, knows how to design, knows how to turn physics designs into engineering drawings to hand off to people who know how to run the machinery to build them. These are complicated. These are Swiss watch-like devices to build them and field them. The W88 is our newest weapon. The last remaining scientist at a lab or engineer at a lab or technician at a lab who worked on a test of a nuclear weapon will be dead or will be out of work in the next 10 years and probably dead in the next 20. And what are we doing? What do we have in place to make sure the next generation knows how to do it? If you can't practice it, you can't do it. It's that complicated, folks. And when we do some of these life extensions, we have to invent new materials because the materials that we used to use are no longer available, no longer exist. So it, these, are, these are not uh, trivial weapons that we, we maintain or they maintain. It, this is a, the biggest concern for me is truly the human capital. And the question is, will the, will the United States be in a position in 10, 20, or 30 years from now, 40 years from now, should the geopolitical situation in the world change and the president needs new nuclear weapons? Are we going to be able to do it? Um, what are we doing to assure that future generations and future leaders of this country will have that capability? Russia will be able to do it. China will be able to do it. Pakistan will be able to do it. North Korea will be able to do it. We should be able to do it. It's optionality, and it's critical. Um, I'll close here by going back to um, the Russians and their new declaratory policy. So given their new declaratory policy, uh, I think a key question also that's still on the table is, uh, if deterrence were ever to fail, and remember, we don't want that ever to happen, right? We want it to be a position of strategic stability, of clear understanding, clear red lines, and people making the right decisions because of their fears and because their least worst option is inaction, not action. That's what we want. That's why these weapons exist. But a key question is if a deterrence ever fails, if, if they miscalculate, and the nuclear threshold is crossed, be it next month, or next year, or 50 years from now, will the United States have the right tools to offer the president to de-escalate the situation 
on conditions, under conditions that are acceptable to the United States of America. So it's not just about deterrence. This is the paradox. It has to be credible, right? So when you hear people say, well, we don't want to give them that capability, they, they might use it. You know, it's a low yield weapon. They'll be more tempted to cross the threshold if we give them that capability. No, we want the adversary to believe we might use it so they'll be deterred. Doesn't necessarily mean we, we will cross the threshold. That's part of the paradox. It's creating the fear, the capability. Um, one thing is certain, if China, Russia, or North Korea cross the threshold of first use against one of our allies, or against US fielded forces in Korea, or at float in the South China Sea, or in Estonia, or Poland, if that threshold is crossed, one thing I'm pretty certain the President of the United States is going to do, he's going to turn to the Secretary of Defense and he's going to say, make them stop doing that now. The question is, will we have the flexible response options available to give the President the options he, need, he would need to make them stop doing it. And I think an answer that says, well, Mr. President, we can put a 200 kiloton device on top of Moscow, that should do it, is not the right answer. One, it's probably not a credible threat. Because remember, the people who are crossing the threshold think that we won't escalate. Because right now, all we're carrying around, and for the most part, is sledgehammers in our rucksack. We have to be able to give him other tools and other options. The nation deserves that, and the president deserves that. So in conclusion, you know, historical evidence and reason lead me to believe that the US nuclear deterrent has successfully accomplished this mission for over 70 years. In fact, I'd argue, as some have, it's the only weapon system we ever fielded that's been 100% successful. We really got our money's worth out of this thing. I mean, it has never failed us, right, for its mission to deter. They have deterred attack on the United States and its allies. They have assured our allies, and though not specifically called out in US policy, they've deterred major nuclear powers from engaging in global conventional warfare on the scale we witnessed in the first half of the last century. And I want to talk a little more about that in the Q&A if you give me the opportunity. Now there, however, there's no evidence that our self-imposed policies and constraints have constrained any other nuclear armed or aspiring nuclear power. Simple prudence now demands that we take steps necessary to ensure the continued health of our nuclear deterrent and the people who maintain it and the people who are responsible for shepherding it into the future. We must recapitalize all elements of the triad and make the appropriate investments in the Department of Energy's infrastructure and human capital to ensure that presidents in 10, 20, 30, 40 years and beyond have the necessary tools at hand to deter effectively against all existential threats to the United States of America. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Now, the, the best part, I look forward to your questions. Please. Thank you very much, sir. I, I neglected to mention at the start, this is being live streamed and it's also being recorded, so you too, sir, will live on in perpetuity. <laughs> Stand up. Um, this is a bit technical, um, so oh. I, I promise, if that sounds like a statement, it's not. Um, my name is Alicia Dressman. I'm an independent consultant. Okay. Um, my question is, one of the defining moments of your career under the Obama administration was spearheading the B61 Mod 12 uh, Life Extension Program Warhead. In its initial phase, this LEP modernized the physics package as well as the non-nuclear components, uh, obviously arming, firing, fusing devices, etc. Then uh, the physics package modernization was canceled and it, they just focused on the non-nuclear parts. Uh, in a future LEP, you mentioned you know, designing new warheads, et cetera. 
Uh, can you uh, envisage a scenario where we would be modernizing the physics package? And I'm focusing on that because then that would, of course, have some CTBT considerations with the test ban treaty and you know, maintaining subcritical testing under those uh, guidelines. So just in summary, is there a future LEP where we would resume uh, significantly modifying the nuclear explosive package? Thank yeah. you. <laughs> sure. Um, you know, f first of all, yeah, I like to take the long view on things. So you can't LEP these things forever. You know, the question was asked of the labs, and uh, the answer is classified, obviously. But uh, so how long will these plutonium pits last? Um, the important thing to understand about uh, plutonium, uranium for that matter, but more importantly, plutonium, it's decaying all the time. It's radioactive. It's giving off heat and energy. It's affecting the components around it. It's a little experiment. It's not just a TNT bomb sitting there kind of inert. It's actually a chemistry package cooking away the whole time it's alive. And it's having effects on its surrounding environment. And certainly the material itself is changing over time, by definition. So at some point, um, we know we're going to have to, if we're going to have a nuclear deterrent, we're going to have to remanufacture, and perhaps even by then, redesign and build new and different weapons. Today, our focus on the life extension program, because of the constraints, is to always, when we have the opportunity, to increase the safety, if we can, and the surety, which means the likelihood that this weapon will detonate when told to and never detonate when not told to. And uh, it's, of course, reliability in that regard as to make sure the deterrent is, uh, is believable. So, yes, one day we will have to, you know, we will have to do that. We'll have to go beyond life extension one day. It's physics. Um, and so I think it's prudent to build the infrastructure today to prepare for that day. So um, that's a prudent investment. Doesn't mean you necessarily start making new weapons tomorrow. But you, um, life insurance is a bad analogy. We talked about this earlier today. Um, it's kind of like, uh, well, should I get a smallpox shot when I'm a newborn, or should I wait till everybody in the neighborhood's infected and then I'll get it at the last minute? No. You take prudent steps. You have a smallpox serum supply. You don't buy life insurance when you're 90, you know, because you've studied the actuarial tables and your family history, and you know at 91 you're dying, so you're going to get the most, your heirs are going to get the most bang for their buck. That's not, the, that's not prudent. Nor is it not prudent for the United States of America to have a capability to produce new nuclear weapons. Doesn't mean necessarily do it. But you should have a capability for nuclear power. Everybody else in the world is doing it. And by not doing it, they're not following our lead. Does that answer your questions? Did I cover them both? Yeah, thanks. Mickey, you had a question. Thank you, sir. Michaela Dodge, I'm affiliated with the Heritage Foundation. Sir, um, have you seen any fundamental changes or developments in the national security environment in the past, let's say, 10 years that, in your opinion, ought to inform the next NPR? Well, yeah, certainly North Korea, you know, the rise of their, their nuclear capability and their focus. The Russian declaratory policy, I think, is important. The change in Russian uh, theater and tactical nuclear weapons posturing. Uh, and the Chinese uh, growth of their strategic deterrent and their theater and, and um, regional deterrent. Uh, capabilities. I think all of those are, are huge changes from the good old days of 1990 when it was just us and the Soviets. People talk about that being the good old days. They weren't such good old days. Um, but, uh, but this is a much more complicated national security environment today. You throw on top of that the risk of uh, loose fissile material, the stated desires by radicals like Al-Qaeda and ISIS that if they ever got one, they'd for sure detonate it. Um, you put that on top of everything. You put these new threats and these new environments and wrap them around our allies, and you have to ask, are they still assured? Um, the Iranian situation. Um, if Iran were to go nuclear, this is just me, but I got a feeling if Shiite Iran went nuclear, uh, it wouldn't be a week before Sunni Saudi Arabia was nuclear. And you remember, Ottomans are not Arabs. 
So it would be shortly thereafter that the Turks would feel a little uncomfortable. And the Egyptians, being a large Arab country, I don't think they'd stand by and let Saudi Arabia have the only nuke in the neighborhood. The, the possibility of runaway proliferation is greater today than ever in our history, I believe. Because the technology's out there, thanks to good old AQ Khan of Pakistan, the know-how is out there. All that's lacking is will, money, in some cases, and material. Japan has all the material they need to make <coughs> nuclear weapons today. They have breeder reactors producing electricity. A byproduct is material they can use for a nuclear bomb. They choose not to, because they're assured by the United States of America. If China goes too far and North Korea goes too far, might Japan go nuclear? And I don't know about many of you have traveled in the Far East. There's long memories over there of World War II, long memories of the Japanese occupation. And the effects that would have on that region, um, well, you, we could talk about it for a long time, I think, speculate about it for a long time. Um, so, yes, did I answer that? I, did I cover the waterfront, Mickey? Anything I missed? Okay. JV? This is for JV Venable. I am also affiliated with the Heritage Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, loved your uh, presentation. One of the things that rarely rises up to the noise level, of beyond the noise level where we can hear it, is violations of START, START II, mm -hmm. and the likes. You mentioned a couple about uh, Russians and how they've expanded their nuclear arsenal while we've been contracting ours. Uh, you've heard about tests in uh, North Korea, but we know in the United States that we've got our own test ban treaty that we abide by. How about the Russians and the Chinese? Can you comment on that and uh, what things we've seen out of them that may not be, uh, well, may be further indicators that at least the Russians are not uh, abiding by their side of the law? Yeah, um, so first of all, the Russians are not in violation by building tactical nuclear weapons. That's the, the START Treaty only address strategic weapons. Uh, what we do suspect uh, they're in violation of is the intermediate uh, INF Treaty, which, if you recall, uh, was signed after Reagan, and the Russians started arming um, missiles uh, that could threaten Western Europe the 1980s and Reagan's administration in response was the fielding of the Pershing II by the United States Army and the ground launch cruise missile by the United States Air Force. And they all got together and said, you know, those things can range Moscow, but none of ours can range the United States. Maybe this isn't such a smart idea. And the agreement was made to eliminate that class of weapons. Uh, we now believe that the Russians have violated that treaty in the development of a, a, a recent ground-based cruise missile, kind of like the Glickham. Uh, that is still being discussed and debated, and I'm not part of that. And I'm just reporting what I read in the paper. So uh, there is that issue that's out there. And, and that all begs the question, what does the U.S. do? If we do determine they're in violation of the treaty, do we withdraw from the treaty? Is that a good idea? Uh, do we provide some other <coughs> deterrent to deter them from ever considering using these things, which they've said they've kind of, you know, it's part of their escalate to de-escalate policy. Uh, that's the bigger question in my view is um, do we have the right tools in place to deter yeah, should they continue down this road and what can we do to compel them to return uh, to abidance by, by the treaty. Um, North Korea was not a signatory so they're not in violation. They're just a rogue state out there doing their thing. Um, and as far as testing, we are not legally bound by the comprehensive test ban treaty. The president signed it, President Clinton signed it, he sent it to the Senate, they did not ratify it. It's still not ratified, so it takes two to tango in this regard. It's not a, it's not a standing treaty. However, uh, President Clinton declared we would abide by the terms of the treaty, and um, that administration interpreted what is a poorly written treaty because it is not specific enough for United States purposes that um, to be compliant, we could produce zero yield from an experiment. So the energy in was always had to be greater than the energy out, even by a tenth of a millionth of a newton. Um, other nations of the world don't necessarily interpret it that way. Um, and so are they in violation? The language is so poor, it's pretty hard to say. 
Uh, are we overly constraining ourselves? Absolutely, compared to other nations. Do we have to constrain ourselves at all? Nope. We're not legally bound, not ratified. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of people who think we ought to put the CTBT back in front of the Senate. Um, I think you need to renegotiate it before you do that. Because as long as we, we interpret it different than the way they interpret it, it's a bad treaty. It's bad language. We've got time for one more question, and I hear this one. Right back. Okay, great. General, thank you. Uh, Tom Carrico from CSIS. Hi, Tom. Uh, you emphasized uh, uh, in your remarks, especially the qualities of the ICBM uh, as stabilizing rather than mm -hmm. destabilizing, really emphasizing this distributed quality. Uh, it takes a lot of aim points and a lot, lot more warheads to destroy that. Right. And I wonder whether in this environment, you know, the warheads sometimes get all the attention, but it's not the delivery systems and the deployment concepts that are really more important to emphasize. The IC being, ICBMs being a piece of that, the Navy is kind of rethinking how it does all its operations in terms of distributed lethality so as to complicate the uh, surveillance and targeting problem for the bad guys mm -hmm. and make it harder on them to, to target what we're doing. Right. So in light of that, uh, what kind of delivery systems ought we be thinking about? Uh, not necessarily new fancy warheads, mm -hmm. but what kind of dispersal and distribution concepts might we be thinking about to improve all this? Yeah, so uh, well, one thing, we've gone in the opposite direction, haven't we, in the bomber force, where we used to have you know 12 wings and bombers scattered all over the US back in the days before the B-52, we had B-47, we had bomber bases in Libya and Morocco and Spain. Now we're down to <laughs> three. Not very dispersed, right? Um, so we could, we could practice exercise, drill, uh, dispersal, and, and the ability to sustain operations for a period of time should we need to put the bomber force back on alert, which, by the way, if I could add a few more minutes here, is the ability to put the uh, B-52 back on alert is incredibly important to the United States of America today. It is our only hedge against a technical failure in one of the other warheads. So you pick any of the other warheads I just mentioned. If tomorrow the National Lab said, we don't think it will work anymore for whatever reason, technical, you're down that many of warheads in your 1550. Because of the bomber counting rule, within a matter of days, we can have 400 Alcoms loaded on B-52s on survivable alert, postured to maintain the deterrent. That's important. In the Cold War, when we could produce 3,000 weapons a year in our Department of Energy infrastructure, we could build our way out of a problem like that. Plus, we had enough mass that, you know, a couple hundred out of 13,000 was no big deal. Today, a couple hundred or several hundred out of 1550 is a big deal. And we can't build, we can't build nuclear weapons as fast as Pakistan can if we said go today. So we can't build our way out of it. Our hedge, technical and geopolitical hedge today, lies in the air launch cruise missile, which is why it's so important to recapitalize it with the long-range standoff missile, which is not destabilizing in any way, shape, or form. They've been around forever, and nobody's been tempted to go first for having them from a strategic, strategic stability perspective. Now, maybe you're begging the question, should we go land mobile with our ICBMs like the, the Russians and the Chinese do? You know, move away from fixed silos. I have a personal opinion that, in, and it's my, I may be totally wrong, but I just don't see Americans feel comfortable with nuclear warheads driving up and down I-90. You know, in China and Russia, they don't get a vote. In America, we get to vote. And I, I just don't see mobile ICBMs as something that, not in my backyard. We're okay with them in the silos and the ground. The farmers don't mind them out there. They're actually some of our best security forces because uh, they, they love them. They're, they're patriots. And if somebody's out in that farmer's field that doesn't belong there, they're the first ones on the phone to our security forces. So I, I, I'm not saying we shouldn't be thinking about it. I'm just saying um, we need to think about it, certainly for the bomber force. On the ICBM side, I'm not so sure. One thing I, would, I do think we need to be thinking about ICBM is alternative trajectories. Um, it's not inconceivable to me that, you know, as time goes forward, that everybody's going to figure out how to do missile defense. Either brute force like we did, and the Russians still do, by putting a nuclear weapon on top of your anti-ballistic missile. We did that with Spartan and Sprint. Or by the elegant way that we've chosen to do today, which is kinetic, you know, just hit it with, with your uh, front end. 
no nuclear, no explosive device at all on it, just pure run into it. Uh, that, there's not a magic about that technology. So it's conceivable that there'll come a day when ballistic trajectories no longer scare people. And remember, it's about scaring people. So we need to be thinking about alternative trajectories, just as the Russians and the Chinese are with their boost glide vehicles that they're testing and flying. We need to be, we need to be investing in that. That's an alternative approach to, it complicates the enemy's defenses, imposes cost on them, which is an important part of your deterrent. Always want to make it more expensive to defend against whatever it is you're invent, inventing so that uh, you, you deter them. If I could just close with one, if that answered your question, is that right? Okay. Tom, if I could close with one thought, and that's kind of controversial, but that's okay. I'm not running for anything. So, you know, there's this uh, notion uh, the world would be a better place without nuclear weapons. And to be fair, every president I know of since Reagan, including Ronald Reagan, um, has said they would like to see a world without nuclear weapons. So it's not a it's not a Democrat issue, it's not a Republican issue, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a feeling that it, it's a normal gut reaction, particularly if you've ever seen how powerful these things are and how they, they, they frighten the hell out of me, frankly. They're scary. That's why they're such great deterrent weapons. That's why they, they do their missions so well. But they're just awful, awful devices when you consider their destructive power. So people naturally will say, it would be a better world if we didn't have these things. And I've heard the argument, you know, for decreasing numbers, it's like climbing this mountain that's shrouded in a cloud, and the top is shrouded in a cloud. At the top of that mountain is nuclear zero. And, and we, the United States, need to lead the world by moving forward, moving base camp up that mountain by decreasing the numbers of our weapons, slowly. And stopping and examining, you know, every time we do a decrease, examine, okay, is everything safe? Okay, it's safe. Let's, let's take a little more risk and go a little higher. And that's the kind of discussion you'll hear from the nuclear zero folks. And what they envision when you reach nuclear zero at the top is they'll all tell you that it's, it's probably not achievable in my lifetime because the fundamental assumption is that when you get there, there will be this omniscient power of human beings authorized by everybody in the world to have this power that will inspect anybody at will to ensure that nobody is cheating. You can't have, you know, if, if we got nuclear zero and you got five you've hidden away, you're the king, <laughs> you win. Even if you're, you know, some tiny country in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, island, you win. Um, I'm not sure what that body would be. Look how, look how much we respect the United Nations, let alone this omniscient power that's going to come in and make sure nobody's cheating. So I think that's a fundamental flaw in theory, but I, I would question it even further. We don't have to imagine what a world without nuclear weapons looks like. We don't have to imagine it. Until 1945, that was the world we lived in. There were no nuclear weapons. And how are we doing as a human race before 1945 when it came to killing each other? For countless centuries and generations, from the first time man picked up a stick and a stone to a sword, a knife, a spear, a slingshot, a cannon, a long rifle, a mortar, an artillery round, a machine gun, every generation has developed new and better conventional weapons to more efficiently and effectively slaughter each other on the battlefields of the world. I'll tell you what a world without nuclear weapons looks like. It looks like World War II. Today we have a hard time imagining what actually happened in World War II globally. We're close to understanding the impact it had on our own citizens. It's estimated that in World War II, between 60 and 80 million human beings were killed. I'm going to pick a middle number, 72, because it's real easy to do math in public with that. World War II was six years old, long, September 39 to August 45. Six years, 72 million people. It's 12 million a year, dead. I'm not talking wounded, dead. Civilians, military, dead. 
It's a million a month. 32,000 plus every day of every week of every month for six years on average died. That's a day and a half of U.S. deaths in Vietnam. It's a single day of U.S. deaths in Korea. Something changed in 1945. I haven't seen anything like that. I know what a world like without nuclear weapons looks like. It looks like Verdun. It looks like the Somme, where 57,000 British soldier casualties were suffered in the first day of a battle that continued to kill a million, a single battle, World War I. Have we gotten less sophisticated and less capable with our weaponry, our conventional weaponry? It's ever more lethal today than it ever was. Is there anything to suggest that humanity would turn back from using that conventional might? Were they not deterred, the major powers, by the nuclear deterrent? It's hard to prove one way or the other, but I see no evidence in the change in human nature that would suggest we would do that. Nothing scales like the death in World War II. And since then, the major powers of the world have decided not to conduct that type of warfare again on that scale. And I would argue it was because of August 1945. Thanks very much.